The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, or bird sins, if possible, that you could remember all this now. 1 John 1, 9 says, If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And that brings you back to spirituality, and that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So let's take a moment for prayer. Confess your sin if necessary. You do it within your own priesthood. You do it in silence. You do it in privacy, but you do do it. So the Holy Spirit can minister the truth tonight. Make, make this hour important to your life. This could be the most important hour of your whole day. And so our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your love, mercy, and grace. And we thank you for all these that have come our way to study with us tonight by automobile and by internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would encourage our hearts and teach us and Recall and put things together in our souls that are important as we look at the new covenant. We are new covenant people. I don't know why, Father, there's so many people don't understand that. Even when they do it, every time they take part in the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, they're told that this cup is the cup of the new covenant in the blood of Christ. And they're to do it in remembrance of him. Then they walk away and live under the old law. It just makes no sense to me. We are new covenant people because Jesus Christ came into the world. He died on a cross, was buried and raised from the dead, ascended back to the Father, is seated at the right hand of God the Father, and that's new covenant. If he doesn't die on the cross and shed his blood, there is no new covenant. But if he does, there is. And the new covenant replaces by fulfilling the old covenant. I pray, Father, this as we continue the study of the new covenant, we would become absolutely convinced out of the New Testament, out of the new covenant teachings from Matthew to Revelation, that we are new, new covenant believers. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are in uh, Hebrews 8, chapter, verse 7. As our passage begins, verse 7 through 13 is where we're actually going. I don't know tonight, but where we're going. For if the first covenant had been faultless and it wasn't, there would, not, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. The first covenant is what we call the old covenant. The second covenant is what we call the new covenant. And finding fault with them, he says... And he, he quotes Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. And we've, we've gone through a lot of this. We've studied it from the Hebrew text, the Septuagint, and the Koine. And it's really important that, that you, ha you have put your eyes on all three of those texts because they change a little uh, due to culture and what, what words mean to people. And it requires some... <laughs> some background understanding of words, right? Jeremiah is coming out of the 6th century B.C. Uh, to us. And um, so, behold, days are coming, says Jeremiah. I remember there under the fifth cycle of divine discipline, 586 B.C. is when this is occurring. Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with the fathers on the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, saith the Lord. Now, you really have to understand that when you read that and compare it to Jeremiah 31 in, in, the, in the Old Testament. For, for this is the covenant that I make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds, I will write them upon their heart, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, 
And then he's going to go on. He's going to teach more on that. Verse 11, they shall not teach everyone their fellow citizens and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Okay? And then he closes it out by saying, and then he comes back to his message. He is quit quoting. He comes back and he says, and when he said a new covenant, he made the first obsolete. Whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. And he's referring to the old covenant because the new one's in. The new one's taking its place. Okay? Now, when, when you, I want you, to, I want you to pay attention. Look at verse 9. Look at verse 9. Listen to what he says. Now, he says the first one is, is faulty. We're told by the 13th chapter it's obsolete, it's growing old, and it's going to disappear. Listen to what he said in verse 9. He said the new covenant, like in verse 8, the new covenant in verse 8 is not like the, the other covenant. It's not like the old covenant. It's not like it. They're both a covenant. They're both automobiles, but they're different automobiles. It's not like it. While they're both covenants, the new covenant is not like the old covenant. Not like it. So it's important you remember that. Don't let people, you are, if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's because he came into the world, died on that cross, was buried and raised from the dead, that's what makes this new covenant. That's 1 Corinthians 11, 25, every time we take part in the Eucharist. We say this cup is the, new, is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as drink it in remembrance of me. Don't, don't sit at the Eucharist or the Lord, what they call the Lord's table or communion or whatever word they want to use. Don't sit there and toast the new covenant and then live under the law. Do you understand? That's blasphemous. Don't do that. Do you understand why? Because, listen, what caused the change of covenants? Jesus Christ came into the world and died on that cross for our sins, was buried, and, that, and raised from the dead fulfills that whole responsibility of the old covenant. And therefore, there's a... So, look. Anyhow. I want to talk about four things tonight about the new covenant. You know, I was probably, I was probably eight years into my Christianity before anybody told me anything about a new covenant. And I lived half my life under the old covenant and the other half under the new covenant. And, and I stayed tore up all the time until somebody got a hold of my life and started teaching me. Half my life was do this, do that, and God will love you. And the other part was, what are you talking about? I mean, I thought you were saved by grace, not of yourself. Was, you know. And so I stayed tore up all the time. I didn't know if I was in or out or what I was doing. And I have to, anyhow. Point number one. The new covenant would become, would, the new covenant would come because the priest nation of Israel broke covenant with God. When you study the Old Testament of Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, in verse 32 it says, and, and it's kind of interesting to change, and I've gone through, I've, I've studied with you what Jeremiah 31, 31, 4, I've I've taught you from the Hebrew text, the Septuagint text, and the Koine text, all right? So if you don't know that, then you should go back and study because I don't know what lesson I'm in now, but I'm pretty, I may only be in verse 8 or 9 or 10, but I'm further with you people than that. Listen, he says he broke covenant. Now, in, in the Hebrew text of the Old Testament, and even in your English Bible, in Jeremiah 31, 32, it says, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them. You know, he's still that t today, isn't he? 
If you read Ephesians, the fifth chapter, you will know that Christ is the husband to the church. The church is the bride. E Ephesians 5. Uh, they broke covenant. They broke covenant. Uh, in our text, in, in, if you've got your Bible still to Hebrews, look at eight, 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 chapter 8, verse 9. Not like the covenant which I made with them. And then it goes down to the very bottom. It says, after the land of Egypt, it says, for they did not continue in my covenant. That's a Greek way of saying they broke covenant. Remember, we, we went through that. They, they did not continue. They stopped it. They stopped doing it. But, but what actually happened was they broke covenant. They broke covenant. They didn't continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, which is actually they broke covenant, uh, uh, and I was their husband. They left me. They deserted me. I was their husband. They broke covenant that mar in marriage. That, he's talking about a marriage as well as a covenant, isn't he? He used the word husband. <laughs> I know. Now, in Jeremiah, I want you to put your eyes on Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the Old Testament, Jeremiah 22. In Jeremiah 22, because I because I need to put your eyes on it because I didn't I I wrote verse nine but I didn't write verse eight and I don't know you'll get nine without eight so I need to have you and then write on your paper where you got Jeremiah twenty two nine also write verse eight you need you need eight and nine in my opinion I just happened to look before I left the house today I looked back at that and I went wow they'll never get that so. Um, Listen to what verse 8, now, it, um, Israel is under the fifth cycle of divine discipline for breaking covenant with God, uh, which is discussed in Le Leviticus 26. You know, the, the five cycles of divine discipline there. Because they broke covenant, not one time, five times. It's a repetitive, wasn't it? He, 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 you know, the first cycle comes in, he says, come on home. The door's wide open, I'll take you back. This is the story of Hosea. And they didn't, even though he gave them seven more disciplines, when the second round came around, they still didn't. And so we go through five. Each time, it's in, the discipline's increased sevenfold. Seven times. Well, anyhow. So they're under the fifth cycle of discipline. Jeremiah's writing about this. And he says, and he prophesies, and many nations will pass by this city, talking about Jerusalem, the capital. And they will say to one another, these are foreign people traveling through, and boy, did a lot travel through and still do. And I'm not, vis I'm talking about visitors, I'm talking about enemies. And many nations will pass by, pass or, or pass through this city, and they will say to one another, why has the Lord done this to this great city? Then they will answer, because they forsook the covenant of the Lord their God and bowed down to other gods and served them. There it is. Okay? Well, the whole nation, Jerusalem's just the capital. When he speaks of the great city, it, it was the capital. The, 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 you know, when the capital fell, so did the whole religious system, right? They took down the temple and everything. That's just a way of talking about it. Breaking covenant, breaking covenant resulted in the fifth cycle of divine discipline. And the reason he refers to the Israel as the bride, uh, the wife, and he the husband <clears throat> is because they committed adultery with other gods. You understand that? I just read it. Okay. Okay. Just, just wondering. Breaking covenant resulted in the five cycles. In other words, he, he, one time they broke it. He says, come on back. Nope. Second time, nope. Third time, nope. Fourth time, nope. Listen, is he not a merciful God? My goodness. What are you people doing with him, right? I mean, what a merciful father, husband. Uh, 
some the discipline, uh, Jeremiah 39 and 52, if you want to get a look at what divine discipline meant to Israel, you could read those passages along with Leviticus 26. Now, out of Jeremiah 22, when he's in this discussion, in Jeremiah 22, in this discussion, there is what's called the curse of Coniah, that's Jehoiakim, but that's been shortened down to Coniah. That was a king during this, um, during the time of Babylon, under time of the come, one of the kings in the time of the ba of Babylon taking over Israel. Okay, the curse of Coniah. You can read about it. It's in our chapter, Jeremiah 22, 24 through 30. This is a very, very important curse that was, the, it's called the curse of Kaniah that was put upon Israel in, in regard to this. The curse of Kaniah is very important to the second coming of Christ. It is very important to the first coming of Christ. This, this, call, this thing called the curse of Kaniah that Jeremiah talks about in, in chapter 22 is very important to the first and second coming. Now, remember in the Old Testament, they didn't talk about a first and coming, second coming. They only talked about the coming of Christ. I mean, the church sets in between them, which is the mystery. The curse of Kaniah teaches that the land of Israel would be under foreign rule without a divinely authorized Judean king until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Do you know how far out ahead of your life God is? Why wouldn't you trust him? Just think, this is in, this is, this is in the 6th century B.C. when he prophesies this. And we're, we're still looking for the second coming in, of Christ in 2018 A.D. And I'm standing here, kid out of Podunk, Michigan, and listen, I understand this. That's, that's, that's a miracle. A guy who wants, who wants to ascribe to atheism and, and just goofy stuff. And I like absolutely understand this. That's amazing to me. The curse of Kaniah is really important because the, when the fifth goes down, when this fifth in Jeremiah in the 6th century B.C., when Israel falls under the fifth cycle, there will never be another Judean team that has divine authority to sit on the throne until Jesus Christ comes back and sits on it, and it will be the millennium. You know, how far, you know how far out that is? And listen, we won't trust him with today, and look how far he's got pl us planned out. Why don't you understand that he's got your next step already figured out? You know, I meet young people all the time. They go, like, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I, I don't know what God, I don't know, you know, especially high school seniors, what you're going to do when you graduate. They, you know, if they have an idea, no telling how that thing's going to change. You know, do you know what is never going to change? While your life will change and your choices will change, you know what will never change? God. So why won't you stick with God? The one the one common denominator that will never change is God. Why don't you walk with God and he's got all of the steps in your life, all your choices, all the decisions ever make. He's already got them planned out from eternity past all the way to eternity future and he's got you covered. When I, when I learned that, my life absolutely changed phenomenally. Trust God. You know, it... I, I say, you know, we use that word, trust God with your life. It, it just preaches good and it lives hard. But I'm telling you, this is the absolute truth. When you look at eschatology, which is the end of time or, or the prophecy of, of the whole ball game, you know, the one common denominator that's always in charge is God. We get all boiled out of shape if something doesn't occur in the one hour, in some one hour that we had such high expectations about, something God rearranges the furniture in your life and you just fall apart. Not understanding that all things work together. Oh, you can quote it. You're just struggling with living it. How's that? Breakdown in the faith cycle. 
do you ever fix it? No, because no, that would mean you would have to stop and study and, and, and get under God's system. You'd rather run on your own with your false expectations and fall apart every time something uh, happens to your life with all of your high hopes. You know, there's a good reason why they call it high hopes. Listen, your high hopes ought to be in God. Otherwise, they're all below. It set your mind on things above, not on things below. People that set their high hopes on things below always, are, always live in failure. I don't know. I don't know why people don't get it. I just don't understand why people don't get it. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah 24:30, thus saith the Lord. Now that should be 22:30. In Jeremiah 22, write this man down childless, a man who will not prosper in his day. That's talking about the king that reigned, that's Coniah. It, it says. For no, no man of his descendants will prosper sitting on the throne of David or ruling again in Israel. Uh, no other Judean king will ever sit on that throne until Jesus Christ comes back. And I'm talking about with divine authority, where God signs off, that's my king. You know, so pay, pay, you know I'll get a letter and say, well, you know, what about Herod the Great? Well, before you write another letter, write, figure out who he was and whether he was a Judean king to start with. But even if he wasn't, he wasn't authorized by God. He was authorized by Rome. Anyhow, in, in Ezekiel 21, 27, he's talking about the fall of Israel. And about the kingdom, listen to what he says. He's talking about, he, 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 he looks at the city of Jerusalem after, after it's been sacked under the fifth cycle of discipline. He says, a run, a run, a run, a run. In other words, he just said that says, run, oh, it's run, it's run, it's run. Now, let me tell you something. When the Bible ever repeats anything, if it repeats it three times, you, get, you jump out of the way. If it says it four times, you better run for cover like a scalded dog. You understand what I mean? When, when it comes out four times, when he goes like a run, 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 it goes four times. It's... It's not repairable. The overwhelmingness of the disaster just takes your breath away. <coughs> There's no possible way this could ever come back. That, that's the way they feel when they see it. A ruin, a ruin, a ruin, I will make it. This also will be no more until he comes, that's Messiah, whose right it is, and I will give it to him. That will be, listen, it's not there now, and it won't be until Jesus comes again. <laughs> Israel will not be back until the millennium. And people go like, well, they're an independent nation. Listen, they're still foreign rule. You say, well, who, who is it? Listen, if it wasn't for America, they wouldn't even be there. Please tell me you understand that. <laughs> if it wasn't for America, America's a foreign rule over Israel is the only reason they're still in existence other than God's favor. You understand that? But we have been the main, and listen, the only reason America has been is because the church of Jesus Christ understood this stuff and has preached it and encouraged it and voted it. <clears throat> and it's a foreign power still over them, but a good one. And we call it an alliance. That's because we're kind-hearted people and we don't ask anything from them. Well, listen, if they've got a friend, it's America. And listen, 
we're probably the only friend they have, and God has given us enough muscle that that's enough. And you know why it is? It's because of the church of Jesus Christ understanding the difference between the first coming and the second coming of Christ and understand something about eschatology. And the church of Jesus Christ has been absolutely faithful to these people, and the people get it and have honored it. Israel's not back because they honor God. Listen, if they honored God, they would honor his son. They don't honor his son. One day they will, but they don't now. I don't mean there's not Israelites who can't be saved. I'm not saying that. I'm saying them as a nation. <clears throat> Listen, everything today is about his son. If it's not about his son, it ain't worth having. You can have every religion. Yeah, I don't care who you got. I don't care if it's who it is. If it's not based on Jesus Christ and his atoning work, it ain't worth a flip. <clears throat> well, why am I saying that? Because we're trying to spare you to go, from going to hell. That's why. Religion ain't going to get you to heaven. I don't care whether it's Jewish or, or whosoever as it is. It's not going to get you to heaven. <clears throat> Well, anyhow, <laughs> you can read more about this in Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, or 5 through 8. You can read it. Listen, it was prophetic. In, in, it was a prophecy out of Genesis 49, 10. You can read about it in the great book of Revelation, Revelation 5, 5, 19, 16. You know, the famous one uh, that Jesus is the king of kings and lords of lord. <laughs> you betcha. The next king who sits on that throne will be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. What a glorious day that will be. What a glorious day that will be for Israel and the church, one in Christ. You know, it's very difficult to win Jews to Christ. You know why? Their religion. Their religion was all built on the coming of Christ. When he came, they threw him out, and they've never, been, never let him back in. It breaks my heart, just like Paul. Paul, when he writes in Romans 9, 10, and 11 about him, it just breaks his heart. It breaks mine. Of all the people in the world, it should be the Jew. It should be a Jew. A Jew came for a Jew. And welcome the Gentile because the Jew refused him. <laughs> that breaks my heart. Point number two. When you study Jeremiah's prophecy of the new covenant in our passage where it's described in Hebrews 8, 8 through 12, you can divide it into two groupings. I want you to go back and I want you to look at this because this will really help you. I try to help you break stuff down so that when you read it, you look for clues, you look for markers. It will help you enjoy the Bible. You know, I used to read the Bible, never got anything out of it. Then I discovered I had to read it with, a, with the Holy Spirit. Whew, that was enlightening to me. And the second thing is to have a good pastor who would teach you how to read it to enjoy it. What, how, to, how to break things down and, and, and look for markers, look for things they repeat and everything. See what he's saying to you. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen. When you read the Bible, you ought to stop and let, it re let the Holy Spirit teach it to you. See, most people, they think that, that they're really spiritual if they read through the Bible uh, every year. No, I'll tell you when you're spiritual is when you read the Bible, you read a passage, stop, and, and then let the Holy Spirit re teach you it. You read it and then let it read you. Write this verse down. I mean, we're verse people. John 14, 26. The Holy Spirit will teach and recall the Word of God. Teach and recall. You don't recall? Teach it. He will teach it to you, and then he recall it. That, that's the application side. But how does he do that? 
Well, he teaches it to you. And then he shows you how it works in your life. So you need to know it well enough when you're going in to how to, how to apply it. So let me show it to you. There's two sections here that you need separate. separate. One is when he says, I will. That's God's part. I will. I will is the God part. They will or they shall is the believer's part. So w watch this. I put it down on your paper. You're going to see two groups. It's the I will God section and I will believer section. Right? Now, in verse 8, yeah, and I gave you, what, what do you speak, suppose all those numbers are for? What, what do you think I put those numbers on the paper? Well, yeah, look. The I will section is used seven times. How many numbers? Oh, my goodness. There they are. And I even went and said, there's one in verse 8, there's four in verse 10, and there's two in verse 12. Right? So, one thing you need is a Bible in it. Because, because yeah, you got to have a Bible because I said, Okay, and so he, he, you got one of verse 8. Do you see that I will? I will what? I will affect a new covenant, right? There's one, right? You remember this word effect is suntelo, S-U-N-T-E-L-O? Remember that? And, and it means to make something complete by bringing, bringing two things together. And that's uh, uh, Ephesians, the second chapter, where he talks about bringing Israel and uh, the bringing the Jew and the Gentile together in Christ to become the church. See, the new covenant is designed to bring Galatians 3.27, to bring the, the Jew and the Gentile together in one in Christ, to bring the male and the female together, one in Christ, the free and the slave, one in Christ, uh, different racial backgrounds, one in Christ, different social, economical, one in Christ. You understand that? That's what he just said. You know, what, you know what's doing that? New covenant. And, and what's the new covenant based on? Jesus Christ. Right? Yeah, oh yeah. This new covenant is, all, is a messianic prophecy. And so the first one is effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And how, how do we get from there so that the Jew and the Gentiles become one? Listen, it's called, it's called who is the mediator of the new covenant? Who is the mediator of the new covenant? Jesus Christ. He's the mediator. Listen, not only is he the mediator of the new covenant, it's, and, and listen, it's through his blood. It's the blood of the new covenant. It's his blood of the new covenant, not the animal, but rather the Lord Jesus Christ's blood of the new covenant, right? And, and not only does he stand there, but in 1 Timothy, second chapter, verses 5 and 6, he is the mediator between sinful man and God, the unrighteous and the righteous, the unholy and the, and the holy, the ungodly and God. Jesus Christ is the mediator between these polarized groups, God, the divine, and man lost. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man called Jesus Christ. And boy, I'll tell you, when you believe that, he will change your life in regard to your thinking about this matter. I am amazed. I am amazed every time I stand up and teach this because I can remember who I was before I got saved. I can remember who I was before I understood the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I can remember who I was and how I thought. And it amazes me today. It amazes me today. 
what he can do with you. It amazes me what he can teach you. It amazes me. Well, in verse 10, there are four. In verse 10, there are four. Let's look at verse 10. There are four of I wills. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. There's one. I will put my laws into their minds. I will write them upon their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Are we new covenant people? We <laughs> are if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. How do I know that I'm a new covenant person? Because he brought it in. He's the mediator of the new covenant. There would be no new covenant until the coming of Christ. <laughs> There's four, right? There's four. And who, who's, who's the I of the I will? God. Look what he's promised you. I will do this. I will do that. You know what we call when God's doing it for us? We call it grace. In the new covenant, we call it grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself is the gift of God, not of works, least seen you mention, but we call it grace. When God's doing it, it's called grace. And all this is I will. I will do If you're in the new covenant, I will do this. 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 And, and, and listen, that's an outline of, of what he's going to do that's discussed in the, all of the books of the New Covenant, all the books of the New Testament. This is just an outline of what you can read about that he will do for you. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, Romans, you know the list. And then verse 12. Watch it. Look at verse 12. I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sin no more. Uh, are you a new covenant person? Mm -hmm. Well, look at here. It says, I will be merciful to your iniquities and I will remember your sin no more. So, why do you keep bringing it up to yourself? I mean, either it is I remember it no more, right? Then why don't you buy into that? How is it that you walk around with the guilt of your past? Oh, I did. Oh, I must. Uh, yeah. Blood take care of it? Hmm? Suppose God is going to say, oh, I remember when you were 23 years old. You think I forgot that? I had got the mind of God. It's just to remember how he uses his mind. He doesn't get nuts when you do. It's good to remember this. Listen to what he tells you. I'll remember your sin no more. If you're under the blood of Christ, I remember your sin no more. The blood of Jesus Christ, one death for all time, for all sin. It's covered. What's wrong with you? Listen, and not only that, why do you bring it up in other people's life? Whose business is it yours? And listen, if you're bringing it up, is God bringing it up? Where is it with him? No more. What does no more mean? It means we shouldn't have be having this discussion again. Why do you punish yourself for something God is not going to do? Listen, all your punishments already been taken care of and cleaned up. You sit around beating yourself up. Oh, if I hadn't done this, I hadn't done that. Why aren't you moving forward? Why are you always walking backwards? Where are you going? I don't know. Well, you would if you turned around. I know, but it's the way I walk. Listen. Here's what's interesting. See the word merciful? The Greek word for mercy and merciful 
is because of the word propitiation. That's the word propitiation. When God is doing it, when God is covering the deal, it's propitiation. When we're receiving from what propitiation gives, when we receive it, it's mercy. Let me show it to you. First John, boy, you ought to want this one bad. I mean, this is talking about your sins. Um, not just yours, but yeah, I got a few of my own. First John 2-2. Two, two. Now, this is a great passage, and it, and it covers our word concept. I'm in verse 2. I'm in, I'm in 1 John 2, 2. And he himself, that means no one else, he himself, I will do it myself, means I don't want to help. I don't need any help. Until we call her, until we holler help, right? Yeah. He himself is the propitiation for our sins. And because, pro, because we have propitiation on our end, what we receive is mercy. We don't deserve it. We, don't, we didn't earn it, right? He, listen, what we have, it requires judgment, but the propitious work of Christ on the cross took our judgment so that we could, that justice could give us mercy. The law requires a penalty, a judgment. But Christ took that on the cross so that justice could give us mercy and we could receive it by grace. Whoa. You ever wake up at night and 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 God wants you to praise him? Huh? That's the darndest thing. Wake me up. And I go like, well, I'm up. Now what? Somebody I need to pray for? Uh, no. I've already done that. You need to get up and do a study or something? Mm, no. Why'd you wake me up? Alarm clock didn't. Rooster didn't. Train didn't. The Lord did. I've got where I know the difference. Do you know the difference? Sure you do if you pay attention to the Holy Spirit and get up and go, what, what do you want from me? What, 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 what's the deal? What are we doing? I'm up, I'm up. Look, I'm up. And it go like, I want you to praise. Let's talk about what you, what's been going on in your life and what's been going on in other people's life. And I mean, we've... Well, you know, when we went to bed, we prayed for all these people before we, we closed our eyes to make sure that th that's all taken care of in case I, I show up in heaven in the morning. Uh, so, I, you know, I've taken care of all that. Well, what's this about? Let's, let's talk about praise instead of prayer. Let's talk about praise. Let's, let's do some praise time. And, you know, when that comes, uh, songs. I'm not a singer guy. Well, of course, you know I am. A songs will come into me. And listen, sometimes they're not all spiritual songs. Sometimes they're just songs that get my heart going good. I might think of an Elvis Presley song or a Fats Domino. Well, all of a sudden, I'm thinking, Blueberry Hill or something, you know what I mean? And it's just like, look, into, and he goes, in this fight, the Holy Spirit, is this funny? Well, that's not bad. Jane, Jane wake up and go, let's go over there. And I'm on the bed going, yeah. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't happen to other people. I'm looking around the room. <laughs> this is making, uh, Isaac, this is kind of scaring me right now. <laughs> I might need to have a checkup. <laughs> well, listen. I will be merciful to your iniquities. That, that's a judgment idea that, because that's without righteousness. That's a judgment deal. I, and I will remember their sins no more. You know what's interesting about this? 
in, in that uh, 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6, uh, where he's talking about the mediator between God and man. You know, it's interesting. There's a phrase, I wrote this down because I was thinking about this the other day. It says, it, it talked about the mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. And it says, who gave himself a ransom for all. A ransom. He voluntarily gave himself as a ransom for somebody. You know, like the shooting in, in, in um, Florida. It's like a guy comes in with a, with a, a weapon. And he, he goes, <laughs> you know, and you confront him. And he goes, I'm going to shoot up this school. And you go like, look, let's just go outside and take me and leave the rest alone. Then maybe if you get him outside, you say, look, let's just go for a squirrel. <laughs> you know, I'm taking the all. We're looking for a, a, a ransom here. Well, let's start with me and get you out of the school, and then let's see what we can do. Okay, I know you want to shoot the weapon. I know. I'm an honor guy. I know. Let's just, hey, you take a shot at him, and I'll take a shot at him, right? But that's that word ransom. That's that word ransom, but, of course, take it into a much larger dynamic. But that's the word ransom, who gave himself a ransom for all. Wow, I mean, shh. and then there's the they will section. Notice this, the, that's verse 9. There's one in verse 9, they will. Look at verse 9. Well, I'm, I, I got to go back to Hebrews. I'm in Hebrews 8, 9, 8, 9. Not like the covenant which I made with the fathers in the day when I took them by the hand, led them out of Egypt, for they did not. See, they're, 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 they did not. That's old covenant. That, that's, that was Israel under the old covenant. They did not. They broke covenant with me. They, they broke covenant. They did not continue in my commandments. They broke covenant. With, then, then again, it's used in verse 11. And, and this is the positive. See, there's a negative side. That's old covenant. Listen to me. And there's a positive side. That's new covenant. Right? The old covenant's always got a negative side, going like, it's always sticking his finger in your nose, going like, what do you, you know, you're not supposed to do that. That's the law. Oh, you know. Be doing that. I'm watching you. Who would want to live under that? Why'd you live under that? Don't be living under that. Listen, here's the new covenant. They shall not, they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother saying, know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them. You know what that, listen to me, and I want you to really get this now, because this is the way evangelism is going to be in the millennial age. That's evangelism in the millennial age. Until then, it won't be like this, but that's, evangelism in the millennial age. That's not the way it is today. I mean, I, I, have, to, I have to teach my brains out. Right? <laughs> I know it's not a big journey, but, but it is one. Here's one. Write this down in your paper because it's not there. Write down... John 6, 45. Now, if you, if you got your Bible, John 6, 45. Go to, go to John with me, because this is really something. I saw this a few years ago, and I went, whoa, how did I miss that when I went through John? Because you do that because you don't have the maturity to pick up it when you do it. It wasn't that it wasn't there. It wasn't I wasn't there. <laughs> John 45, 6, 45. Look. Now, this starts in verse 41 with Jews grumbling uh, uh, against him when he said, I am the bread that comes down from God from heaven. I've come down. They went, <laughs> maybe from the first story, come down from heaven. And he says, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. Look at verse 45. It is written in the prophets. They, they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. 
You got a study Bible? He's going to quote two things really important. If you got a study Bible, he's going to give you Isaiah 54, 13, and Jeremiah 31, 34. Now, yeah, and there's more, but these are important because they are both talking about the millennial age. Isaiah 54, 13, the reason they put that in, the, in your study Bible, because they want you to connect Jeremiah 31, 34 with Isaiah 54, 13, because that's exactly what Jesus was doing in his Bible study, because he was the new covenant, and this is where that thing was going. And see, the Jew understood that when Christ come, this all would happen, but they thought it would happen Im immediately, and it didn't. But listen, here's what's important. Jesus brought this to their attention in John 6. Now, when he gets to John 14, 15, and 16, he's going to expose all this about the new covenant and my blood business, but like in Luke 22, 20. It's just kind of interesting. None of that was on your paper. I just wrote it in because I remembered it. Here's the third thing. Wow. The new covenant is an unconditional covenant. An unconditional covenant, the terms are determined by God and upon him. In other words, it's up to God. The unconditional means the terms are dependent upon God and not upon the believer in their fulfillment. God will fulfill his covenant in your life. That's grace. That's why we're under grace, not law. Under law, you've got, you've got to have works. And, and, they're, and they're designed to cause you to fail. And you go like, what's up? And they go like, Jesus Christ, that's what's up. The law was designed to point you to Christ, Right? Galatians. This makes the unconditional covenant superior to the conditional covenant. This makes the three unconditional covenants that we're interested in tonight, the Abrahamic, Davidic, and the new covenant, makes them superior to the Mosaic law. Makes all three of them. All three of them are superior to the Mosaic law. You can read about this in Galatians 2, 16 through 21. Actually, Galatians, Galatians chapter 2, 3, and 4 are actually the book. <laughs> you know, only got five, so I just took most of it. Now, let me close. I can hear inside my voice everybody going like, thank goodness. The New Covenant believers are warned Listen to me now. New covenant believers are warned not to leave new covenant theology of grace for old covenant theology of law. In Romans, the seventh chapter, verse six, but now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound so that we serve in newness of the Holy Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Whoa. The writer of he Hebrews is explaining that the old covenant is faulty by divine standards of Christ. It was designed to point mankind to Christ not to and not to replace or be a substitute for him. That's the subject of Hebrews 8 through 10. Here's one. 2 Corinthians 3, 4 through 6. Such confidence we have through Christ towards God. Well, what a great line that is. Not that we are adequate. Look at the word adequate. How many times is it used? That's right, three. Is that a marker? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Not that we are adequate in ourselves, considering anything is coming from ourselves, but our, our adequacy is from God. Can you remember that? Our adequate. Oh, yeah. Until you, you get between the rock and a hard place, <laughs> then you think you have to move the rock. Yeah. But our adequacy is from God, 
who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of letter, but of the Holy Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives. And listen, actually, it's a compound word. Zoeopoieo means to make alive. And he puts it in the present tense. It's a present active indicative. Not only does he start you off with new life, but he's what makes new life, new life. And it's a continuous journey. That word zoo is where you get the word zoo in the English, but it's also the word zoe. Zoe. Zoe life, that's the life that comes from God. It comes from God. It is about God. It is forever God. Zoe life. Why the law then, some would ask. It was added because of transgressions. Adam, having been ordained through the agents by the by, angels by the agency of a mediator, Moses, until the seed, Messiah, would come to whom the promise had been made. Galatians 3.19. Galatians 3.24, therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. It's the purpose of the law. Why the law? Because all the law can do, if you try to live by the law, you will fail. Failing is good this time because it points you to Christ. The law couldn't save you. can only condemn you. Oh, Mm, told you, I told you, I told you. So it is. Be no covenant. Get away. Get away from that old covenant. If you're in Christ, you don't need it. He's got a whole different system for teaching and for operation. It's called the ministry of the Holy Spirit, not the, not the letter of the law but rather the freedom in Christ through the Holy Spirit. Well, let's close in prayer, and then we'll have our prayer, and those who have to leave for some reason or another can leave, uh, and we'll have our private prayer time. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these that have come our way to study with us the Word of God. Discussion over the New Covenant and what it means to be New Covenant believers. What a special day we live in in, in biblical history. I mean, oh, God, if we could just grasp how important the life we are living at a period in, in human history and understand that God has designed our time here and we're in a, a capsule of destiny in Christ and God has great plans for our life. Oh, what a thrill that is to my soul to know that from my life. I'm living out the dream. The one that God has for my life, not the one I had for my own. I want to thank you for that. I pray that every person could find that in their life because it's available. It's what God wants from us. Understand the capsule that we live in called destiny. I thank you, Father, for these that have been so attentive today, and I pray... The things that we've said today, the Holy Spirit would minister both by learning and by living in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.